One, flight of the pink carpet. Beamer didn't have a clue where he was. He just woke up and boing, he was circling in the air around a castle. He'd have preferred an F-18 or a stealth fighter. What did he get? A flying carpet. Talk about obsolete. He could forget Mach 1. Skateboard 1 was probably pushing it. What was worse, the carpet had a temper. How do you hang on to these things? Whoa! He yelped as he was suddenly flipped into the air. He managed to grab hold of the carpet's fringe just as it dived through a large window in the castle. Whoa! He exclaimed as his stomach turned inside out. Incidentally, the castle was pink. Yeah, pink, as in bubblegum, peppermint sticks, and Barbie toys. Come to think of it, so was the carpet. Pink, that is. He hated pink. That was the color his big sister Erin wore all the time. Frankly, if he wasn't dipping through the hallways of the castle and holding on for dear life, he'd never have taken a flying pink carpet seriously. The next thing Beamer knew, he was on the floor looking up at a pink crystal chandelier about the size of his house. Whoa! If that thing falls on me, I'll be a sparkly porcupine, not to mention dead. It seemed like a good idea to get out from under it, but for some reason he couldn't move. He felt like he was wearing a straitjacket. He tried to wiggle free. No such luck. Then he looked down. That rascally carpet had wrapped around him like a cocoon. Great! Now he was a bug in a rug. A little breathing room, please! He called out to the carpet. That was when Beamer noticed that he was rolled up at the foot of a huge pink staircase. It was shaped sort of like an hourglass, narrower in the middle than at the top or bottom. For all he knew, this could have been the very staircase where Cinderella lost her glass slipper. Why anyone would wear a glass slipper was beyond him. One step is all it would take for his sister to crunch it into smithereens. Then she could forget being found by the prince who was posing as a would-be shoe salesman. Of course, if the only way this prince guy could recognize her was by her shoe size, he probably needed glasses as thick as binoculars. Either that or the fairy's spell on Cinderella included some major plastic surgery. Suddenly, Beamer heard loud crunching and splintering. He jerked his head up to see an elephant swinging on the chandelier. Yep, you guessed it, a pink elephant. The big pachyderm was filling the air with pink glass like a hailstorm. Then Beamer heard something groaning and then wailing in a high pitch. The chandelier is about to fall. Beamer twisted and turned, trying to get the carpet rolling. But instead of rolling across the room, he started rolling up the stairs. Hey, what happened to gravity? You can't roll upstairs. But then what else could he expect from a flying carpet? Ow! Ow! Hey! Whoa! He yelped as he bumped along, lickety-split, up the stairs. The staircase must have been much taller than he thought. He just kept on bumping and rolling without coming to the top of the stairs. Of course, he wasn't seeing things all that well. Spinning around in that rug was making him pretty dizzy. Everything was swirling around like a pink tornado. Beamer finally thudded to a stop. As the whirl of pink in his head slowed down, he noticed that he was no longer on the stairs. He also began having second thoughts about what he was wrapped up in. It wasn't a rug or a carpet or a straitjacket anymore. He was in a cocoon. A pink cocoon. What was worse, he was stuck in the middle of a huge pink spider web. He twisted and kicked, trying to break out of the cocoon. The web shook beneath him. Pretty soon it was shaking even more. He strained to tilt his head back. Then he saw it. A pink nightmare whose eight legs were churning in perfect order across the web. Soon he was going to be one big slurpy for that hairy spider behemoth. Soon it would be all over. No obituary, no tombstone, no nothing. Since none of this could possibly be real, Beamer McIntyre wasn't even going to be history. He was just one more fantasy character crumpled and tossed into the trash can. He flailed about one last time trying to escape. Beamer thumped on a hard surface. 
Ow! he yelped in pain. Anxiously, he fought the confinement of the cocoon. Finally, he threw it off. But it wasn't a cocoon anymore. It was a blanket. His sister's pink quilt. Yuck! No wonder everything was pink. His blanket must have been in the wash, and his mom snuck his sister's on his bed under the bedspread. He looked up and saw the ceiling with the ice cream cone water stain. He was back in his bedroom, on the floor, next to his bed. It was all a dream. A silly old dream, he sighed. Talk about twisted fairy tales. Beamer, you'll be late for school, his mom called from the kitchen downstairs. Stove, plate foa low, toasta on, he heard her say. The only way to get the kitchen appliances to work in this house was to talk to them. But you had to talk to them nicely and in a southern accent. Californian wouldn't cut it. That's where Beamer had come from, California. Living on Murphy Street in Middle America was turning out to be a whole new ball game. Mom! A shrill voice shouted at the same time. Where are my pink Nikes? It was Beamer's big sister, Erin, otherwise known as Zero Zero Zero. Those are the coordinates for the center of the universe, which is what she thought she was. It was totally disgusting. As far as she was concerned, everyone and everything else in the universe revolved around her. Also at the same time, Beamer heard alternating thumping and slapping sounds on the staircase. That was the sound of a strange quadruped named Michael, his nine-year-old brother, who always came up the steps on all fours. The last set of sounds came from his dad in the shower. Too hot! Too hot! He said to the plumbing. Cold! 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 Ah, just right. This was why Beamer didn't have many sleepovers at his house. During history class, it finally occurred to Beamer where at least part of his dream had come from. It should have been obvious. It was the web. His web. Nearly two stories tall and as wide as the house, the famous McIntyre web was the nightmare in the attic, the greatest entomological mystery this side of Cleveland. Up until Christmas, the scientists experimenting on the web in their attic weren't even sure that it was a real web. Some thought it was man-made, somebody's joke or a hobby project or a mad scientist's experiment. But back on Christmas Eve, Malgotha, the webmaker, had returned. She'd spun a cocoon around every piece of scientific equipment surrounding the web. Then she sucked the electronic life out of them, leaving them totally useless, as dead as the flies in the little web under the corner gutter. So now, scientists from all over the country were in the McIntyre attic, hovering around the web, hooking up this and that sensor. More than ever, the attic looked like the bridge of Darth Vader's Star Destroyer. Cameras now monitored the web 24-7, and multiple alarm systems registered every movement. The only reason the McIntyres were still willing and able to live in the house was because the scientists calculated that all of the security systems gave the spider only one chance in a hundred of getting down where they lived. Of course, that one chance in a hundred was covered by family prayers every night. How many spiders do you know of that get into people's prayers? That was three months ago. Spring vacation was only a half circle of the moon away, and still nobody knew who or why or what Malgotha was all about. Part of Beamer hoped they never would. It was kind of cool having a big mystery in your attic. Except for the fact that it gave you the heebie-jeebies every time you got near it. You could never lose the feeling that Malgotha was up there somewhere, hiding in the shadows, smacking her chops for your yummy red corpuscles. His history teacher interrupted Beamer's little daydream with a question. Unfortunately, he didn't hear the question, something you could never admit doing in Mrs. Hotchkiss's class. She wasn't called the drill sergeant for nothing. Beamer hemmed and hawed, tugging at his polo shirt collar. 
He'd read the assignment for Pete's sake. Uh, could you repeat the question, please? He asked sheepishly. I, uh, just missed the last couple of words. Murphy Street, his teacher said simply. Huh? Beamer asked, remembering nothing about Murphy Street in his history lesson. Isn't that where you live, Murphy Street? She asked, growing impatient. Uh, yes, ma'am, that's where I live all right, he said with a fake smile. Good, Mrs. Hotchkiss said. Come by my desk on your way out. I have a little favor to ask of you. Beamer groaned. A favor for Mrs. Hotchkiss could be anything from banging chalk out of the erasers until you were coated white to making a full-scale papier-mâché statue of Genghis Khan.